everybody. My name is Catherine Meyer. I'm a principal investigator at the Center for Gene Therapy and assistant professor at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Today I'm going to talk about new cell models for SCN2A research and also talk a little bit about the hopes and prospects of gene therapy for this disease. These are my disclosures. So the Center for Gene Therapy at Nationwide Children's Hospital was um, really jump started by Dr. Jerry Mandel, who was the director until 2017. And then it's been taken over by Dr. Kevin Flanagan. And we focus on neuromuscular diseases of both children and adults. Um, our center was involved in 14 different gene therapy clinical trials. Nine of these have actually been uh, originated directly from our center. Um, just before we get into the details of gene therapy, there is different types of gene therapies that people can think of. Um, gene therapy really means the transfer of genetic material to treat or prevent diseases. And this can be done in several ways. One of them is gene replacement. That simply means that um, researchers put a healthy copy of a non-functional gene back into the cells um, to restore the function. Another option is uh, gene silencing to reduce uh, the expression of a toxic protein or a toxic RNA. And then there is a third aspect that's called gene correction, where we either can isolate cells, uh, for example, from the bloodstream, correct them, and then put them back into the body. Um, or a little bit more complicated, there can be in vivo correction directly into the you know, organs in, in neurons or in the brain, um, or correction of mRNA expression or, or production levels. Uh, gene therapy also comes with associated challenges. One is immune reactions against the vector or the transgene. Another challenge is that the virus can target unwanted organs or cell types, and therefore the protein could be expressed in cell types that don't need it. Another issue can be mutagenesis if the vector inserts itself into the human genome. This is very rare with the current gene therapy vectors. Um, most importantly, to the, at the moment, gene therapy is not reversible. That means once a patient gets treated, we can't alter the treatment, and therefore it's very important that we understand the mechanisms and the dosing very well before we get into the clinic, and that obviously adds time to the development of the therapies. Uh, redosing at the moment is very complicated because once you receive the gene therapy vector, it almost acts like a vaccine, so the body will defend itself against future treatments. So you've heard about the risks, so why would people still want to do gene therapy? Uh, mainly if there are no other treatment options or if the treatment options that are available um, are not as good, so there's substantial uh, room for improvement. Also, if, if the diseases are severely debilitating, so there's a high benefit to risk ratio that, that really grants um, the exploration of gene therapy. Another issue um, is diseases that are affecting um, organs that are very large, so there is a wide distribution, which sometimes is difficult for small molecules to, to really target. And also, um, you know, one of the most attractive parts of gene therapy is the long-lasting effect of just a single treatment. So, especially for uh, diseases of the nervous system, there are several challenges for, for regular therapy development. One of them is the, the sheer size and the distribution of the cells in this organ. Also, there is a large variety of different neurons and other cell types in the brain and spinal cord. And then the uh, nervous system is protected by the blood-brain barrier, um, which is naturally made to keep things out. And so a lot of drugs are not able to actually um, pass these, uh, these hurdles. And gene therapy is one approach that can be very efficient to overcome these problems. What we're using at the moment in the clinic are so-called small adeno-associated viruses, um, and often um, the serotype 9. These are small, replication-defective, non-enveloped viruses. They can infect dividing and non-dividing cells, and they only integrate into the uh, host genome at a very low frequency, if at all. And most importantly, they are not known to cause any human disease. And they have a very low um, uh, immunogenicity, meaning that the immune system is not going to react uh, in a toxic way to it. And they are also suitable for a large-scale production, which is important if one wants to make a drug. Basically, what we do is we, we take the natural virus and we remove all the genes that make up the virus, 
and we replace it with a therapeutic gene that we want to get into the cells. And the virus um, really, in that case, acts as a mailman to really just bring the message into the cells. In um, the Casper lab, my former mentor has shown in uh, 2009 that AV9, which is just one of the flavors of these small viruses, is very efficient in getting through the blood-brain barrier to the brain and to the cells in need. And this is, you know, a, a genetic um, a therapy can really get a long-lasting effect with just a single treatment instead of having to reintroduce the, the treatment multiple times. So I'm going to show you a little bit about the results of these initial clinical trials that we did with AAV9 for spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, real quick, spinal muscular atrophy is a severe disease of infants. It's affecting about 1 in 10,000 live births, and it leads to progressive paralysis within the first year of life. Um, this is a very severe disease, and 50% of the patients uh, don't survive uh, until 10 months. And as you can see, after that, obviously, even more patients die. Um, so what we did is we uh, re did a gene replacement uh, gene therapy to bring back a healthy copy of the gene. We had two cohorts, 15 affected children were treated, and we measured survival as well as strength. And here is the data from the first cohort. This was only three children. We had two cohorts, as I mentioned before, and here you can see the data from the first cohort measuring the strength on something that's called the chop intent, which really measures how much the kids can move. And you can see that all three children in cohort one show the steady and slow increase in the ability to move, which is something that is never seen uh, in this disease without treatment. Uh, cohort two, who got a higher dose, uh, but also was treated at a younger time point, you can see that many of the children had a very drastic improvement of strength, and some of them even reached normal levels. Um, this is one of the success stories, one of the children in our clinical trial that instead of being completely paralyzed or even dead, is now walking around and can eat by, by herself. So it's, it's really, really gratifying to see this happening. And this is with a single treatment. And this drug actually was approved in May 2019 by the FDA. Despite this initial success story, there are still challenges for intravenous uh, gene therapy with these viruses, especially for neurological disorders. Um, one of them is the vector production. So we still need to make a large amount of these viruses and therefore the facilities, the, the production time, and also the price is really high. Um, there are potential safety concerns and considerations in older patients as the doses increase um, with the intravenous delivery. Therefore, we think that the CSF delivery directly into the spinal fluid uh, is a potential way to circumvent some of these issues. And we have a lot of preclinical data supporting that this could be a good solution, and so do other researchers as well. So here I'm going to show you a quick example about how we translated a CSF delivery approach into the clinic for Batten disease. Very quickly, Batten disease are lysosomal storage disorders, uh, meaning that uh, in the nervous system and other tissues, um, trash is accumulating in the cells and they are unable to actually get rid of it. And that leads to neuronal death. Um, the patients show um, inflammation, degeneration of neural function, vision, and ultimately, um, you know, they lose all their functionality. There is multiple genes that can cause this disease. And this was a collaboration with Sanford Health. Um, we, we were splitting up both safety and efficacy studies in, in mice and, and non-human primates. Basically what we do is we take a, a, the virus and we insert the human healthy gene and use this in a mouse model of the disease to see whether we can rescue the mouse. And what we're looking for is really behavioral changes because this is a neurological disease and also the survival of the animals. And here's just a quick example. Um, on the left side, you have healthy animals. In the middle, you have diseased animals that weren't treated. And on the right side, you have animals that have the disease but were treated with the AV vector. And what you're looking at is the accumulation of this trash in the brain, in different brain regions. And you can see that the viral vector is very efficient in reducing the accumulation of this material. And this led to a very strong improvement of uh, both behavior and survival. So on the left side, um, you see a, a, a graph where the mouse has to run on a spinning wheel. So this measures balance and motor function. 
And you can see that the wild type animals, the healthy animals, as well as the treated animals were doing equally well. Whereas the untreated animals were starting to struggle at around eight months of age. And when you look at the survival curve on the right side, you can see that the untreated animals were dying around 14 months of age, whereas the healthy animals um, and the treated animals had a, a normal lifespan for a mouse, which is about two years. So um, the intrathecal dosing, as I mentioned, makes, takes advantage of the lumbar intrathecal space. Um, this is a very standard procedure. Um, a needle is put into the space to directly access the spinal fluid and, and the virus is then distributed with the spinal fluid throughout the entire nervous system. And um, this, this approach has been taken for both spinal muscular atrophy for older patients, but also for Batten disease in two different variations. And the interim data that you can find online is really promising. Um, this is just one slide showing you a little bit of interim data from a Batten disease uh, clinical trial. In red, you see the natural history, um, um, how these patients usually progress if they have the disease and aren't treated. And in blue, you see um, a summary on how the patients do when they are treated with, with our gene therapy. So there is a pretty big difference between um, the gene therapy treated patients and the untreated patent disease patients. These are preliminary data. Um, so obviously the studies are still ongoing, but initially this looks really promising. So how can that apply to SCN2A? So let's go back to our slide with the different types of gene therapies. So when you look at gene replacement, this is very challenging for SCN2A because SCN2A is a very large protein and doesn't fit into our gene therapy vectors as is. But there are a lot of researchers that are working on new vectors and new approaches that might make this possible in the future. Um, the gene silencing approach um, could be a potential um, promising strategy for SCN2A mutations that are gain of function mutations and cause toxicity. Uh, however, you know, this would not help uh, the patients that have a loss of function. So when you look at gene correction, um, we can't really isolate the cells and treat them in, in tissue culture and put them back into the body because we're talking about the nervous system. Unfortunately, this is only possible with, with blood cells or, or other organs that can regenerate. Um, so we are really stuck with, with you know, a, a small choice, which, which is the in vivo modulation of expression. And I'm going to explain you a little bit how that works. So one of the most famous approaches is, is using a CRISPR-Cas approach, which is basically a bacterial enzyme that can cut um, your genome in, in different spots and can and fix it. And um, this is often a mutation specific approach. That means every patient would have to have its own specific therapy. So that is a little bit complicated to, uh, to achieve. Um, also one of the issues that CRISPR technology still has is that it can create off target effects. So meaning that the enzyme is not completely specific. It could go and cut somewhere else and cause issues. Um, also, uh, in some, some cases, the technology has been changed in a way that the protein would have to be expressed long term. And that is a little bit um, concerning as well because CRISPR Cas9 is a, um, the Cas9 enzyme is a bacterial enzyme, and expressing a bacterial enzyme in the nervous system over a long time period could potentially have uh, safety, safety issues as well. But one thing that is really good about this this approach is that you don't really need to know what the mutation is doing. If it's a loss of function or a gain of function, mutation doesn't matter. Whatever you do to correct it will fix um, you know, the problem. Um, another, another approach to do that really is with acting not on the gene itself, but on the RNA, which is really kind of a working copy of the gene. Um, and this is an approach that's called splicing correction or trans splicing. So really what we're trying to do in this case is to replace some of the pieces that make up the, the RNA and ultimately lead to the protein production, which you see here on the screen, we would want to replace, for example, number two and three, which corresponds to that one loop in the protein here. So one of the, one of the drawbacks of this, this technology is that the efficacy needs to be proven for every single piece you want to replace. 
And also in this case, there could be off-target effects. Um, so in order to understand the different technologies that we can use working with both the gene and also the RNA, I want to explain you a little bit more how the intracellular pathway works to generate the functional protein. So here you see a gene. Um, it's basically composed of exons and, and pieces in between, which are called introns. And um, first, the cells make a working copy of this gene, which is called the mRNA. And the mRNA only contains exons. And then from the exons, the cell can make a functional protein. And in this case, you can see that our functional protein would read a big dog ran and sat. So if uh, the patient has a mutation that is a stop mutation, uh, basically one of the coding elements is interrupted. And after that element, the protein is not produced anymore. So in this case, for example, um, we would still get a protein that is a big dog. So we do understand a big dog, but we don't know the rest of it, the RAN and SAT. So that is a protein that is potentially partially functional. Um, mutations can also cause a what we call a frame shift, uh, in which case the mutation basically completely ablates um, the message or changes the mes message that comes after the mutation. So in this case, um, we would still be able to read a big dog, but unfortunately, some really weird gibberish has been added to the message, and this often uh, le leads to a protein that actually can have an altered function, and, and those altered functions can be toxic as well. Often the cells recognize it and actually degrade such proteins, but that's not always the case. Um, Another var variant would be missense mutations. In that case, um, the only thing that's changing is one letter. And in that case, you basically get a protein that spells a big dog LAN and SAT. And as you can see, you get most of the information. You have the dog and you have the sitting. And then the dog does something in between that, that we don't understand. But usually such mutations can be very mild unless they are in a very important spot of the protein. So. When you look at the transplicing or, or the, um, the, the splicing correction, what we would do is basically we would use the viral vector and replace um, an entire piece of the RNA or the DNA. And in that case, um, basically you could get, no matter what mutation you have, a fully functional protein made because you are replacing everything that is affected. And therefore, this is a strategy that could help a lot of p uh, patients at the same time, provided that they have the mutation in the same area of the protein. And again, this is a very good approach because we don't need to understand the function of the sequence. We don't really need to understand what the mutation is doing, and that's sometimes important. Another thing that's really important is that we don't change how much RNA the cell actually makes, which can also be important. Um, unfortunately, the biggest problem of this approach, which is a really nice approach, is that it is very ineffective. And that is something that my lab is really interested in to try and see how can we make this more efficient so that we can use this um, in the clinic. All right, we already talked about uh, CRISPR technology, but there is actually newer uh, modifications of CRISPR te technology as well as small molecules that can just modulate the levels of protein produced. Um, here is a quick example of you know, what's happening in patients that have a de novo mutation. So in these patients, uh, basically one of the chromosomes contains a healthy copy of the protein um, that is still a healthy copy of the gene that is still making a functional protein. And the other copy um, has the mutation that doesn't lead to any functional protein production. So in many cases, um, this cannot be sufficient for the cells. Sometimes the cells just need more of the protein. And what small molecules here indicated by a star or gene therapy vectors can do is basically push the healthy chromosome to make more protein. Um, so this is something that is also very interesting and will be promising for, for a larger patient population. Okay, just to summarize the gene therapy part, um, gene therapy for SCN2A is unfortunately a bit challenging because of the, the function, it's a sodium channel, but also the size of the protein. So there is a lot of options that we don't have or are more complicated. 
but there's uh, multiple groups, including mine, that are working on solutions and there are potential solutions out there that we can use. Um, there are promising approaches that are in development and um, we are working really hard every day to move these forward. Um, both DNA, which is the gene itself, or the RNA can be used as targets. Likely, um, the solutions that we are going to come up with are not a fit for all. Um, so we'll probably have to develop multiple uh, approaches and targets. So one of the questions just looking at this is, okay, how are we going to determine who can benefit from a certain type of therapy, as I just laid out, and who cannot? And, and that's where the disease modeling with the patient cell lines comes in. Very briefly, uh, my lab has developed a um, method to use patient skin cells and transform them into neurons and other cell types of the nervous system, including astrocytes, for example. Um, a lot of other groups are using similar methods as well. What we can do, for example, is then measure the response of cell, uh, cell lines of individual patients to a certain drug treatment. And here is one example. One thing that we saw um, with this in vitro method using the skin cells is that uh, the scn 2 a patients actually produce less neurons or the neurons die or have shorter neurites. Um, and this could be corrected, uh, at least in the case of these three patients, by, by a compound. So, so there is promising uh, research moving forward also on the small molecule front. However, one thing that we have to be careful is when we see a, a correction or an improvement in such an in vitro model, we still have to test it in mouse models and see whether it holds true in the context of an entire organism. Because I told you, one of the issues with the drugs is the delivery. We need to get to the right place. And that is a, is a big problem. Ultimately, the drug testing with the patient cell lines is, is really important because we can use machines that can accelerate uh, testing. So, for example, here on the image you see um, the InCell 6000, which can read plates that, can, that have 384 wells. So we can test 384 conditions in theory at the same time. Okay, um, I hope this was informative and please don't hesitate to reach out with additional questions should some of the questions not be addressed in, in the answering and uh, questions section. Um, here you see a picture of my lab and also very significant funding that we got from many patient foundations. And also, um, of course, families of SCN2A that have been supporting us. This is a picture from the last meeting in Seattle where we were able to go and present some of our data. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thanks so much for that, Dr. Meyer. Uh, that was super informative. And I know speaking on behalf of all the families watching this, um, definitely put a lot of our questions and concerns into focus. And uh, we really appreciate the work that you and the lab do. Um, we do have a few questions from families. Just wanted to ask you those. Uh, here right now while we have you. Um, and first of that, first of which is, which variants uh, or variant types do you have represented in your cell lines? I saw you had a few in there. Um, and if you can't answer that question, I guess the follow-up would be, um, how would your research translate to other variants? Um, you know, especially you, you, I think in that last slide, you were showing small molecules, for instance. Uh, yes. drugs like that. Well, that's a very good question. So what we're trying to do is have a, a different bandwidth or breadth of different mutations exactly for this reason. You know, we're interested to see whether we can use this technology and whether the same molecules um, will work in some of the different types of mutations. That seems not very logical uh, if you look at the gain versus the loss of function. However, some of the molecules that we're testing are just addressing, for example, cellular stress. And, and so they could potentially uh, have an effect in both loss and gain of function mutations. What we have in the lab right now is a mix of uh, both splicing mutations as well as uh, gain and loss. So yeah. we're always looking for new patient cell lines if, if families are interested to, to participate in research. So I guess off the back of that, the follow-up question is, which we also have from a family, how can we get involved? Uh, do we need to send skin cells to you in the lab? What's, what's that look like? Is there a process? So I think the best way to get involved is, is to contact uh, the families of SCN2A Foundation. 
and they I think they have started putting together a registry of patients that are interested in or families that are interested in getting involved in the research and what we're planning to do is basically have um, a meeting in Columbus Ohio where we can do the skin biopsies right at the same meeting but if you can not participate we also we are able to work with doctors around the country so what we would need basically is just a contact and a either a hospital or a doctor that's willing to perform the skin punch and it can then be sent overnight to nationwide children's the only thing that has to be obviously arranged is a consent form that needs to be signed but all of this can be done over the phone um next question what's the time frame for clinical trials as a board member dr meyer we get this question all the time and i think a lot of parents are frustrated as frustrated as they are excited so yeah. please i'm asking be as clear as you can here with this answer <laughs> that's a very difficult question and i think the it's very important to not over promise because there is so much at stake you know there is the, the life of these kids is at stake and um, i think that's why the researchers are also always very vague even if they have some promising strategies that they're developing um, the problem is once you start running the safety studies um, you could still find something that then could prevent a program from moving into the clinic. So until you run those final safety studies, until you really present um, your package to the FDA, there is always a chance that they could say no. I do yeah. think that um, so many clinical trials, additional clinical trials could potentially start at some time mid next year not necessarily for gene therapy, but potentially for, you know, small molecules. But again, um, you know, this is something that still has to be approved by the FDA. And that is a hurdle that, that can be really tough to take. Got it. No, that's, that's both informative and promising. And it makes sense. Uh, there are lives at stake, but we're also desperate for answers. So if, if that's a working timeline and a target, I think that's, that's great news. Can you address the variability in SCN2A patients? You, you mentioned uh, splice site gain and loss. Yeah. Uh, how different treatments may be different in different cases. So is this, you know, you, you said a few times the protein is larger than a lot of other gene therapies that are out there. There's a lot of variables. So yeah, yeah. How, how, do you, how do you make that decision? How do you make that call uh, between the different therapies? Yeah, I mean, I think that is a, this is a really good question. So <laughs> the problem with SCN2A is, is the size, but also that it is embedded in the membrane of the cells and it's embedded in a very complicated way. So there is multiple, what we call transmembrane domains. So it goes in and goes back out and goes in. And um, it forms this channel that is very selective for sodium. So um, as you can imagine, there is there's a number of things that can go wrong. Um, so if you don't make enough, so then you, you don't get enough um, sodium channels on your membrane. That's one problem. But if suddenly your sodium channel also lets in, for example, calcium, you have a completely different problem that could be very detrimental. So um, if you have mutations inside the channel that actually change how specific the channel is, that is something that usually leads to more severe gain of function mutations. Um, unfortunately for, for um, SCN2A also, this is a protein that is so specialized that you can't just remove like a piece of it. Like we do, for example, in, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, you can create what we call a mini gene that is only 30% of the size of the full length. And it's not completely functional, but, but it does help uh, a lot. So in SCN2A, wow. in the case of SCN2A, creating such a mini protein is very, very difficult because it's so specific and it has a, a very a specific and dedicated role. Um, but one thing that we observed in our cell lines, as, as I told you, that we are working with both gain and loss of function mutations, that there could be common pathways that are affected in the cells that are related to uh, cellular stress or cell cellular energy consumption. And yeah. so, so there is a potential that certain drugs might be working in a larger patient population that is not only, for example, loss of function or gain of function. But it will be important to test the drugs on the cell lines of the patients first. Understood. So I think along that, and kind of as a follow-up to the variability, 
Does the age of the patient make a difference in the treatment options? Are there, as you've been looking at this and studying this and, and, and really trying to put a, a big amount of your time and effort and resource into this research, are you seeing that age of patient be a huge difference or is there a, you know, a range? So I think there is two aspects around age that are important. One of them is the disease progression and how much damage has been already caused by the disease. And the other one is the dosing, um, which is especially important for gene therapy. So right. what we see in gene therapy um, oftentimes, you know, is that the kids that have been treated at a younger age had a better response to the gene therapy compared to patients that were treated at a later age. But that is mainly because the kids that were treated at a younger age um, weren't as far progressed in the disease compared to the older kids. There was less inflammation. There were simply more cells that we could rescue. Um, sure. Each disease is different. So it really depends on whether, you know, the neurons are, if the neurons remain healthy enough and, and survive, um, I don't think necessarily age is an issue in treatment, but oftentimes the disease and the seizures just have some other effects on the body that are pretty profound in terms of learning abilities and, and other things. And so it's not it's not just getting the gene back and, and the child becomes normal. So that's something that's very important to keep in mind. However, the, I think it is, you know, the potential to learn and, and, you know, if the families, I think if the gene therapy becomes reality, it will be very important that the families are patient and that they also give the children learning and, and physiotherapy support so that the kids have the best optimal environment to, to actually make up for what they potentially missed. Um, the dosing, um, you know, for larger patients, as I said, for example, if you will go with an intravenous delivery could be challenging because of the immune reactions. For intrathecal delivery, um, it, this seems to be less of a problem. So we do expect that we can treat patients even in their teenage years. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, to your point, families watching us at home, a lot of the things that we've struggled with is understanding how researchers will talk about rescuing the gene, but maybe that not directly impacting a lot of the comorbidities that have built up over the time. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really great uh, thing to keep in mind as we look at what an actual cure is and what that that result would be for kids that are a little bit older. Um, okay, and finally, uh, on a, hopefully a brighter note, we would love to hear, you know, how has the, the Families SCM2A Foundation impacted you and your work? Um, you know, yeah. just kind of an open-ended question to, to wrap things up. Yeah, I mean... They had a huge impact uh, on us and on our work. So one thing that's really important for my team is to understand what we're working for. Um, this is a, we are in the hospital. It's a very transla translational lab. So we don't only do basic research and uh, families of SCN2 actually came here to visit us um, with several families and children. And it was, it was just breathtaking for the team. It was so motivating. Um, and, you know, so that's one aspect, you know, knowing what you work for, the motivation, uh, getting to know the families, but also understanding the disease from the parents. I think one thing that is underestimated in the clinic and, and often underestimated by, by the MDs is that the parents and the families know so much more about rare diseases compared to the MDs because they have their full day with more frequent diseases that they work on. and. Um, it happens pretty often that I reach out to families of SCN2A with an idea or with something about the disease course. Hey, have you seen this? Or do you see, you know, seizures happening at a certain time during the day or things like that, where I think the reach of the patient foundation to help answer such quick questions that we that we have in the lab are extremely important. And then, of course, um, the third part is is the support, the funding support for these projects. You know, we are extremely grateful for everybody that's working so hard every day to fund um, to fundraise um, research unfortunately is very expensive and um, it couldn't be done without you guys yeah well thanks for that and again uh, dr. Meyer you know really informative talk uh, lots of details in there and I think it's gonna provoke more questions and more feedback but um, 
definitely exactly what we need at this time. So thank you again. Thank you very much.